Bishop Willis, thank you for that enthusiasm very much. And uh, I'm going to ask you to stand at this time. We're going to begin with the reading of God's word. Austin Barker will be reading and praying for us this morning. So let the one who has ears to hear, hear what the Lord has to say to his people. This is God's word. I'm going to be reading Exodus 15, verses 1 through 18. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, and the, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of, the Lord is a man of war, and the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk into the, in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like, like a stone. Your, hand, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, your, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters pile up, the floods stood up in a heap, the depths con congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the almighty waters. Who is, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Uh, pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom demayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. Uh, till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you've, you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your mountain. Uh, the place, O oh Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O oh Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Let's pray. God, I just want to thank you for this day and thank you for bringing everybody here safely. And I hope everybody takes something from today's message. And I hope everybody has a safe day. And in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, hello everyone. I just wanted to come up here and give everybody an update of the yard sale that we had yesterday for the Come As You Are meeting. Um, if I could get everyone who donated or helped at any point in time to stand up. Come on, stand up, 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 up. Thank you. Like it was so amazing yesterday. Can we give everybody a round of applause? There was a lot of donations for us not being able to store stuff this year. We had more stuff than we've ever had uh, the previous years, which is absolutely amazing. And then also usually we do it two days and this um, year we only did it one. And the total was $1,332.58. So I've been having people ask me if we, we are going to have a fall one. And I'm really not sure. I will um, definitely pray about it and think about it um, and let you guys know. And me and my husband also talked about um, for next year, just so we do have storage space, we will rent a big storage unit. That way we can gather stuff and collect stuff. And it's not so um, chaotic, I guess, that morning with people bringing stuff. But I just want to thank everybody. Um, for helping make the yard sale a success. And now, there she is. Dana's going to come up. Thank you.
Thank you, Tasha. Good morning and welcome to Split Log this morning. We're glad to have you here and a part of worship. We invite you to fill out a prayer request card. These should be located on the seat back in front of you. You can put your prayer requests or praises on the back. Put that along with your tithes and offerings in the bucket there at the back in front of the media booth. If you didn't get a bulletin, the guys in the green vest would like to give you one of these. And I'd like to draw your attention to a few announcements. Today at 4.30, we'll have a leadership meeting. And at 6 o'clock tonight, we'll be having the theology class. Everyone's welcome to come out and be a part of the theology class, even if you haven't been here before. That's okay. We have a shower table out in the foyer for Caitlin and Briley Waits. They're expecting a baby boy very soon. So we'd love for you to join with us in showering them with gifts for the little boy. We still need volunteers for the social committee. So if you've been thinking about that, there's still time to get involved. Just see Ashley Wilson for any questions on that. If you are a new volunteer to Children's Church or the Children's Ministry in any way, we do need to have a background check on file for you. And those forms are available on the table in the foyer. If you'll just pick one of those up, fill it out and get it back to myself, April McCool or Miss Johnny's Johnston. Um, we'll get those taken care of. Um, that is something required by our insurance here at the church. So please take care of that as soon as possible. And then men, you have a men's breakfast coming up on Saturday, May 15th. This will be at nine o'clock at the home of Linda Patterson. So please make plans to be there Saturday, May 15th at nine o'clock. Eight o'clock. Miss Linda decorates it beautifully. I was just giving her props for her lovely home, but we'll let Ralph reside there as well and be there at eight o'clock. See, nobody's gonna forget now. Y'all thought, see, that was planned. Be there at 8 o'clock, men, on Saturday, May 15th at Ralph's house. Okay, we're so glad you're here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you so much for this day and that we can come together and just enjoy each other's company and laugh and uh, just grow closer to you and closer as a people, Father. Please open our hearts to hear what it is you're speaking to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. As you get to your feet and get prepared to worship this morning... Just try to keep in mind that you have made plans to be here. You have nowhere else to be right now and nothing else to do but to worship God. And did you notice what they did when they crossed the Red Sea? The first thing they did is they started worshiping. And by worship, that means that they just mentioned who God is because that's who God said he was. They talked about what God did for them. And they even talked about what God was going to do in the future because that's what God said he was going to do in the future. So don't waste this opportunity. You got nowhere else to be this morning. So I searched the world but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures it fades. Never now that you came along, put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your life. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you.
wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, all in the grave. Done with the high, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh my God. 
this is it's going to be our last song and we introduced it a couple weeks ago as a new song so it's not new anymore so i just want to draw your attention to verse number three come behold the wondrous mystery christ the lord up on the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. There's not much more to say than that. So. just thank you for what you've done in our lives and I thank you for what you just continue to do I thank you that you're big and you're greater and you're perfect and God I just thank you for what you're changing in me individually and God I just ask that you touch Pastor Shan and give him the words to say that will change us even further in Jesus name amen I'll let you do the kid kiddos can go to your prearranged children's church places and if you don't know where that is, uh, there, are, there will be responsible adults, not people like me necessarily, responsible adults out there who will help your kids know where to go. 
And if you want to keep your kids in the service, they're welcome to stay here. But if you want to go to Children's Church, I can tell you that they're going to get the gospel preached to them there. As they're going out, I do want to remind you that uh, there is theology class tonight. And if theology scares you, it shouldn't. We're going to talk about it. You have all the opportunities to ask questions. Trent is going to be leading that tonight. Trent Cook, one of our pastors here. And so come be a part of that. We do want to let you know that on the second Sunday, we usually have a prayer service, but the second Sunday this month is Mother's Day, and we have made the decision to uh, be afraid of mothers and not plan anything on Mother's Day evening. So next Sunday night, we will not have our prayer service or meal. So um, honor your mother, pray for those who have lost their mothers, and pray for those who, uh, for whom Mother's Day will be a, a difficult day. And I um, also want to remind you, just because of the uh, confusion, May the 15th at 8 o'clock, Ralph will be setting up breakfast for some other people there. And uh, Ralph gets to live there, too, with Linda. And we're grateful for both of you uh, for helping out with that. Let's pray together, and then we will dive into the Word here. God, thank you that you have given us each other. Thank you that you've given us music and biblical lyrics to worship you and we pray that you would continue to let us submit to your word and your truth take all opinions that don't come from you and take them out of our minds this morning let us submit to your truth and we thank you that when we come together this time of worship is a foretaste of deliverance like we just sang and we thank you that we have a lamb who hangs on the cross, hung on the cross in our place, but no longer is on the cross, but is now at the right hand of your throne. Help us submit to that, believe it strongly and firmly, and commit more deeply to your truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The One of the things that we sang, and I didn't necessarily plan on bringing this up, but there is a verse that we sang that really has a lot to do with Exodus chapter 14 and 15. And as you're turning to Exodus chapter 14 and 15, let me give you the real quick version. In Exodus 13 that Trent talked about last week, we see the preparation for them leaving Egypt. In Exodus 14 and 15, we see them leaving Egypt. But there's also some very difficult things that the people of God, the Israelites, have to face while they're in the process of leaving Egypt. And we sang this this morning. It says this, give me grace to see beyond this moment here. Now I'm going to jump forward a little bit and tell you what happened in the story. The people of Israel were camped and where they were camped was right by the sea, the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh's Egyptian army with chariots and the very skilled, most core part of their military come after them. And at that point, God says, okay, it's time to move. And the Israelites are saying, what do you want us to do? We got nowhere to go. We are in an impossible situation. And then Moses, speaking on behalf of God, says, stand firm, fear not. Give me, he didn't say this part. This is the song we just sang. Give me grace to see beyond this moment here to believe that there is nothing left to fear. We are often in situations where we are racked with fear because we seem to be in humanly impossible situations. But a humanly impossible situation is not an impossible situation for God. It's something that he can easily overcome and deal with. And so we need to have that on our minds as we're looking through this passage. I also want to echo what Dana said, and thank you for those who are teaching children's church. Thank you um, to all the church for allowing me to teach children's church last week. It was awesome because children ask really great questions and better questions than adults. I hope that doesn't offend you. Hopefully you knew that. But I got to teach them the Trinity. And of course, I didn't explain everything to the Trinity uh, about the Trinity, but it's so much easier to explain the Trinity to kids than it is to adults because kids go, how is that possible? And then we say, well, the Bible says it is. And they go, okay. And it was fantastic. So I would encourage you to teach children's church. Uh, I forgot to bring that part in earlier. So there, but let's get back to what's going on here. We see the, the, the Israelites who were slaves coming out of Egypt in last week's passage from chapter 13. I'm actually going to borrow a little bit of the passage that Trent preached on. I want you to look at chapter 13, starting in verse 17. We start seeing the details of what's going on. When Pharaoh let the people go, 
God did not lead them. This is again, 13, 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. So let me give you a reminder of what Trent said last week. From Goshen to Canaan, Goshen was where the people of God were. Canaan was where they were supposed to go, the promised land. It would have been about an 11-day trip the short way, but God didn't take them the short way. God didn't take them the easiest way, but God took them the best way. But there was no way humanly possible to see this as the best way because when he comes out of the land of Goshen and he starts directing them down toward the Red Sea, if you had a map of Egypt in front of you, you would go, that ain't the way to Palestine. That ain't the way to the land of the Philistines. That's not the way to Canaan. And he goes the opposite direction and he tells them why. Why would he do that though? They go the wrong way down to Etham. After all, they were equipped for battle. That's what we just read. They were equipped for battle, but they weren't spiritually ready for that kind of trial. So what does God do to keep them from the battle with the Philistines? He puts them in a place where eventually he's going to have to, they're going to have to be in battle against a much stronger military force, the Egyptian army. So he puts them in a situation where the unbeatable army of the Egyptians was going to come after them. But we'll see as we read this passage, God was taking them the best way. So let's don't forget what Trent said last week. Don't begrudge the long way. Sometimes there will be things where God will lead us in a direction. We don't understand why he's going. It doesn't seem humanly possible to get to where God wants us to be going the direction that God is taking us. But don't begrudge the long way because the long way, and I'm just quoting from Trent here for the next couple of sentences, because the long way is most likely the mercy of God on your life. He would rather take you on a long journey that ends with your joy in him instead of leading you through the shortest and quickest way that will end in your destruction. So God is going to put us in situations or allow us to be in situations that seem humanly impossible to get out of. But, as we're going to see in this week's passage, that is also the way where God gets the glory. And when God gets the glory, it is for your greatest good. If you truly want your best life, and I mean the biblical best life, not the guy that preaches down in Texas kind of best life. If you really want your best life, it may not come right now. Instead, we will have to endure in seeking God's glory. But if you do that, he may put you in seemingly impossible situations. That's exactly what he does to the people of Israel. Look at chapter 14, starting in verse 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. And the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back. Remember, they were going the wrong direction. To turn back and camp in front of pi Hahiroth. We don't know where that is. Between Migdal and the sea. We don't know where that is either. In front of Baal Zephon. Don't know where that is either. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Why did God do this? Why did God do this? Now, like I said, we don't know where these places are, but we do know that they were going the wrong direction. Then God told them to turn back and go to camp in this place, specifically by the sea. And then he uses the word for in the ESV, which really means because I want Egypt to try and come attack Israel. So, God says, so I can get glory. But what did this mean for Israel? It meant that they were going to be in a really scary situation that they thought and felt like God had abandoned them and they were just going to have to trust. But God did this for his glory. He takes Israel the long way, puts them in this situation for his glory. And if that scares you, if that makes you uncomfortable, if that worries you, don't worry. When God is getting the glory, that is what's best for you, even if if it temporarily scares you or sometimes causes you pain. God's glory is for your greatest good. When God is seen to be who he is as clearly as possible, that benefits you. It helps you to understand him. It helps you to see his power. It leads you to worship and love for him and joy in him. And that's greater than your plans to take the easy way every time. Look at verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we've done? 
that we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army overtook them encamped at the sea by Pi Hahiroth in front of Baal Zephon. So why, Pharaoh is looking at what the Israelites are doing. And he says, okay, you want to you go? You want to go to the Canaan? Okay. But what they do is they go and they wander around for several days, maybe as much as two weeks, and they never leave Egypt. The path that they took, they're still in Egypt. They don't, they don't ever cross the Red Sea, and there's not a way to get out of Egypt that way. They have to go up. They're supposed to be going up northeast, and they go, they're supposed to be going northwest, and they go southeast. And Pharaoh says, what, what were we thinking? They're confused. They're lost. We should have never let them go. Let's go get them. Let's get together the strongest part of our army, and let's go. Now, let's ask this question. Remember what Pharaoh has just lived through? Ten plagues. And you could consider what's about to happen in the 11th for Israel, but it is a mighty miracle for uh, a, a plague for Egypt, a mighty miracle for Israel. He's seen these 10 plagues. He finally, after he had lost his firstborn and everybody and every animal in Egypt had lost his firstborn, he decides to go test God one more time, to test the God of the Israelites one more time. Why would he do that? Well, one of the reasons is the theology of pagan religions, which is that their gods were very moody. The, the gods of those days in pagan religions would change their minds and just kind of on a whim decide to do something. After all, some of their gods died at night and then came back to life in the morning and they would be angry here and they wouldn't be angry there. And so they assumed, hey, the tide is turning. The people of Israel are lost. They're a bunch of dumb idiots. Let's go get them back. Not thinking, Yahweh's going to get me for this. Instead, he's thinking, Yahweh's lost all power. Their people can't even get their way out of Egypt. They don't know where to go. They failed orienteering. They don't know how to get out of here. Let's go get them. That's bad theology, but it's the theology that we share sometimes. Sometimes we feel like God has changed his mind and that God isn't going to keep his promises. But what the Bible tells us very clearly is that God never changes. He's the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Travis alluded to the verse last week where it says, Jesus, God is never going to have any variation or shadow due to change. He is going to be the same, and you can trust him. The one true God does not change. But that was only part of it. He also, Pharaoh went after them because he's stubborn, sinful, and hard-hearted. And as David Strain says, we have a similar heart to Pharaoh. Whatever is given to you, if you're left to your own nature, and I really want you to pay attention to this part, if you're left to your own human nature, with, apart from grace, but you're left to your own human nature, you will always find a life of sin more compelling than life on God's terms. If you're left to your own sinful nature, a life of sin is always going to be more compelling, is going to seem more comfortable and seem more enjoyable to you than a life in God's will. And unless the Lord himself intervenes to change your heart, you will resist and refuse and reject the evidence just like Pharaoh did. But God, we just read in our small group this morning, God wants everyone to be saved. So what he's saying is, I don't want people to act like Pharaoh and have their hearts hardened. I want people to come to me. I want people to submit to me. And so we're to do that. And we need to be clear of the message of Romans 1 that says, if we continue to live in sin and we continue to reject Jesus, that eventually we can be given over to a debased mind and a hardened heart. That's what had happened to Pharaoh. We need to make sure it doesn't happen to us. Because we can't look at this and go, Pharaoh's dumb. I'm glad I'm not dumb. Because that would not be seeing the point. The point is not about Pharaoh's stupidity. It's not about Israel's faithfulness. It's about God never changing and always being faithful and always keeping his promises. So when you are in impossible situations, seemingly impossible situations, you can trust him. Why? Because he never changes. Even when it feels like he's changing, he never changes. Verse 10 not only did Pharaoh have some faith problems and didn't understand God's nature, even we as God's people can sometimes respond the same way Pharaoh did. Verse 10 says, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. Their backs are to the sea and they see the most powerful military in the world at that time coming with 600 chariots. 
And they feared greatly, and the people of Israel cried out to God. They seem to have quickly forgotten, quickly forgotten, just like Pharaoh, just like us, that God can overcome those difficult things in our lives. Now, as Christians, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know God has been so good to you. Actually, if you've been a Christian for five minutes, you know that God has been so good to you. He saved you. He has redeemed you from hell, and he's been good to you. You also have learned over a life of submitting to Jesus that he can be trusted. But isn't it true still sometimes about us that when we get in these very difficult and scary situations, we start to say, God, I'm not real sure whether you are good or not. We start to want our old life. Look at verse 11. They said to Moses, Is it because, this is some really, they were throwing some serious shade here. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done in bringing us out to Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. Isn't this what we said to you? That is not what they said. When Moses came to the elders of Israel and said, hey, God wants to get you out of slavery in Egypt and he wants to send you to the land that he promised Canaan, the elders and the people were like, yeah, that's great. I am sick of mud brick making. I don't want to see another mud brick ever again in my life because I've been a slave all of my life and I don't want to do it anymore. That's a great idea. Let's get out of here. But all of a sudden, they start complaining. And they want their old life back. Moses, we're going to die out here. It would have been better to stay slaves and at least be able to live. The call to our old lives is still loud like this. When things get difficult, sometimes we wonder to ourselves, even if we don't have the guts to admit it out loud to somebody else, we wonder to ourselves if it's worth it. We wonder to ourselves if following God is this difficult. Why am I doing it? God, if following you leads me to this kind of pain, I thought thought you were going to make my life better. And God throughout the Bible says, I am. But you might suffer in the process because God knows what's best for you. God knows what's best, and so we have to trust him in these difficult situations. But the call to our old lives is loud. We think, just like the Israelites, if serving God feels so scary, wouldn't it have just been better to live in slavery to sin? Why don't I just go back? To what I was comfortable with before. For some of you, that may be a life completely outside of the church, completely outside of Christianity. For some of us, that, and this is, I think, an even more dangerous call, the call is, hey, just go back to doing the church thing, but ease up on devoting your life to Jesus. It's not worth it. Ease up on all that, giving all of your heart, mind, and soul and strength to Jesus. Now, keep going to church. You don't want anybody saying anything bad about you. Keep serving where you're serving. You want to you put on a good face. Honor him with your lips, but I'm going to let my heart be far from him. That's just going back into slavery in a different way. It's either the slavery of our old lives to sin or the slavery of the lives of legalism, where we try to earn God's favor by pretending that we can do that by being good people and by being busy. But we can't, and we have to remember that sometimes sin does feel comfortable, but it's always a false and an ending comfort. It's never a permanent comfort. It's temporary comfort. The example that I want to use here is my problem that I have with cereal. I love cereal, and we have a problem at my house. We probably legitimately have at least 12 different kinds of cereal at any given time in our house, um, and we have them all in plastic containers because my wife is very organized, and I can go into the pantry and see all these cereals and covet of what I'm going to eat. And usually when I get home late at night and realize for me late at night is 9, 9.30. So on Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, and Friday nights, I get home from church and I am just so hungry, or at least I tell myself I'm hungry. And so what I do is first thing, I try to ignore everybody in my family and I go, I'm, I'm kidding. Anyway, I go and I, I'm, going, I'm about to have a, a life-changing experience with a bowl of cereal. And I just inhale the first one. I, I just... Everybody leave me alone. Dad is hangry and grumpy and everybody kind of knows. Let him have his cereal. Don't hang on my neck. I've got to eat cereal. So I eat my first bowl of cereal, but I eat it so quickly that I don't realize that I'm actually satisfied. And so what I do is I think I got to have another bowl. 
You know what's in there? I had granola the first time, but now there's crackling oat bran in there. Or maybe I can steal some of the kids' chocolate cereal. Who knows? There's so many options. So I go in there and pour myself another full bowl of cereal, and I eat it, and I go, that was amazing for about five minutes. And then the dairy and the sugar and everything else and putting way too much of all that in my stomach says, that was dumb, wasn't it? And you would think I would learn from that. But about every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, that same thing happens on repeat. And then I think, you know, I'm just going to drink a whole bunch of water and make myself feel better. And just pour more stuff in there. It's a temporary comfort. It feels comfortable in the moment, but it leads to greater pain in the future. And in, the same thing happens with sin. There, sin feels comfortable in the moment. It's like comfort food from your past. It feels like, well, this is what I do when I get stressed. This is what I do when I get tense. This is what I know to do because we, we allow ourselves to think sinfully. Following Christ through this hasn't worked. So I'll go back to my old way. And that's exactly what the people of Israel do. And they're doing what we do. We like to read the Old Testament, especially in Exodus and Judges. We go, these people of Israel are stupid. They do not learn their lesson. And then we look in the mirror and we look at our past and go, oh, me too. But what did Moses say to the people? Well, when God takes you the long way, you may start to question whether he's good. And if you do that, you are in good company. I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, I question God. I must not be a Christian. You're in good company. As Christians, we all, in times in our relationship with God, question his goodness. But that doesn't mean anything is wrong with God. That, that doesn't say that there's any limitation with God. The problem is with us. When God takes you the long way, you may start to question whether he's good and whether he's worth trusting, but the Bible always answers this the same way, and we sing this over and over again. He is worthy. He is worth trusting. And that's what Moses told him in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm. Now, if he just stopped there, they would go, oh, okay. But you see, there's water behind us, and there's the Egyptian army in front of us, and you're just going to tell me not to be afraid? That's like when you're worried about something and somebody comes up and says, hey, don't worry about it. Oh, thank you so much for that great sage and wisdom and advice. I'm worried about it because I don't see a solution. And that's the same thing here. But he doesn't stop there. He says, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. It's not just about, he's not giving this message, hey, don't be afraid. You're good enough. Don't be afraid. Egypt can't hurt you. Don't be afraid when you see the storm, you tell the storm that you're coming after him. I'm quoting things I've seen on Facebook. When the devil whispers in your ear, you whisper in the devil's ear. I won't back down. That is not what we're talking about here. He says, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. It is a God thing. It is not you being good enough or smart enough or talented enough. He will work for you today. It is a thing that only God can do. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. Bible translators had to put it that way because they, they couldn't just say, would you shut up and trust God? They had to put it in a nicer way, but that's the thrust of it. God's going to fight for you. It's time to hush. It's time to close your mouth. Watch what God is going to do. God is so worthy of our trust. And what Moses told them, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you. If we stop right there, it, derives, it applies directly to us. But he may take you the long way. See, I stopped it today. He was promising them that it was going to happen today. And if you think, well, God, just, he just freed them immediately. And I want God to free me immediately. Remember that they had been in slavery for 400 years. They had grown up being slaves. They only knew a life of slavery. And the 10 plagues may have been anywhere from three to nine months. And in those three to nine months, Pharaoh was making their, their life even harder. And then they wandered around in the wilderness for two weeks in Egypt and we look at this and go, well, God just immediately delivered him, immediately delivered him. No, he didn't. But they did get to the point where he could say, trust me, and today I will. But if we take out that today, that is still absolutely true that applies to you. Fear not when you feel like giving up, maybe especially when you feel like giving up. Fear not. When you don't understand, stand firm. When you're weak and you feel like giving up on God and giving into sin, stand firm. And if you do, you will see the salvation of the Lord. 
which he will work for you. You may not feel that today. I woke up in a funk today, not a depressive funk. You don't have to worry about that. I'm not going back that direction, but just in a funk. I've had such a great three weeks that I woke up this morning and immediately I was like, well, that's not right. Why do I not like life this morning? I just thought it was because it was early. So I get up and I go have a bowl of cereal, believe it or not. <laughs> and I think this is going to make me feel better. I'm going to get the sugar rush. and I'm going to go. It's Raisin Nut Brand this morning. You know, this is the go-to breakfast. Nope. And I get to church and I go, well, I have my prayer time. It's going to be better. And nothing is working. Nothing is working. And I get to prayer time with the praise team and they're like, how's everybody? And I keep my mouth shut and finally I'm like, I don't like today. I don't like it. But through the ups and downs, which you and I all go through, God says, if you remain in him and if you, in, if you endure in him, you will be saved. He promises you that he will save you. You will have bad days. You will have bad days for a whole bunch of reasons. The biggest reason is because sin in your life and sin in this world, but also because God allows you to go through times of testing. He'll put you between the sea and Pharaoh. But... The Bible assures us that the one who endures to the end will be saved. And if you need biblical evidence for that, write these three verses down. Matthew 24, 13, James 1, 12, Hebrews 10, 36. All these verses say the same thing with different words. Matthew 24, 13, James 1, 12, Hebrews 10, 36. If you still forget that, you can watch the, the sermon on YouTube later on. But all these verses say this. If you remain in Christ, you ultimately cannot lose God will work salvation for you. But endurance means submission to him for the rest of your life. So he tells them to stand because this is the last time they're going to face their Egyptian attackers. Pharaoh's army, the unbeatable army on the face of the planet, is coming. And basically, what Moses says is, hey, don't worry. Because you see them today, you're never going to see them again. God is going to deliver you. Trust God. He is going to work this out in a way you could never have imagined. And if we endure in Christ, the day we stand before Christ in heaven or when he returns, whichever one comes first, we are going to have the spiritual clarity that we've always wanted and we're gonna look back and say, oh, God was doing all that for my good and his glory. The Lord still fights for you. All you have to do is be silent. That doesn't mean you do nothing. But you listen, you listen and you obey. The reason that we know it doesn't mean do nothing is because what, he, what he says in verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Why are you crying out to me? Break camp, get all your stuff together and go. It's time to go. There's a time to pray and there's a time to pray deeply and for long periods of time. But sometimes the will of God has been revealed to you so clearly or it's just written in the Bible where God is also saying to you, hey, what are you still asking me for? It's time to obey. It's time to do the thing that you know that I'm telling you to do. But in their situation, what were they going to do? They're between Pharaoh's massive chariot army and the Red Sea. God, what are we, you're telling us to pack up camp and go. And to pack up camp means that they were going to have to get all their kids, all their belongings, all their livestock, and it would have taken several hours. We're going to have to get all this together. Okay, we're going to get it together, but then where are we going to go? We're going to walk into the ocean? We're, not the ocean. We're going to walk into the sea? Yeah. yeah, believe it or not, that's what we're going to do. Look at verse 16. He tells Moses, lift up your staff, which had just been his normal shepherd's staff, but God was using it for his glory now, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. You, know, you may have grown up in church and you just read that sentence and go, yeah, that happens. We know that. You realize what happened here? He just says, hey, pick up your, pick up your stick. Stretch it out over, and uh, you're going to walk through on dry ground. I'm assuming, it's not in the Bible, I'm assuming Moses goes, oh, I mean, all right, but I have never seen that happen before. I have never seen it happen. Verse 17, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Do you see how important it is that God knows, that, that God makes sure people know who he is? And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who is going before the host of Israel, this is verse 19, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. 
and there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. So on th- this guiding pillar that was the presence of God that Trent talked about last week got between the chariot army and Israel. The army was left in the dark, but on the side of Israel, it was lit up. God knows how to distinguish who are his and who are not. But still, chariots that are being pulled by horses move a lot faster than slaves who have to carry all their stuff probably with some pull-behind wagons and have to go through an ocean. Not an ocean. I keep saying that. It's the sea. It's not the ocean. If you've seen Joseph, the, not, yeah, Joseph, the prince of Egypt, and you know it, it splits together on two sides. Yeah, that, that's what happened. But there's not a whale in the Red Sea. It, it's just, it, there's no way. Anyway, that, I shouldn't have even said that. So let's get back to verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord, it wasn't Moses, the Lord drove the Red Sea, the sea, back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And as Austin read from chapter 15, it said, the deeps congealed. And the word that he uses for walls is big walls, like city walls, not like fences or retaining walls. There's an amazing miracle here, and yet we are tempted to doubt that God can do these miracles. A lot like people before us. There are people who try to steal glory from God, even those who claim to be Christians, who will refute what happened. They will say, this is not a miracle. And they say, it wasn't the Red Sea. Instead, it was the Sea of Reeds, which was known to be shallow and marshy and could quickly dry up in the right conditions. So they claim that the depth of the water was just a few inches, dried up naturally. But let me say a few things about that. The Hebrew, this, this might, might come across boring, but I think it's really, really important for us to believe these things and to at least hear this side because you're going to hear the non-believing side for the rest of your life. The Hebrew translated Red Sea here is Yam Suf. And Yam in the Old Testament only ever means a large body of water. Yam never means lakes or marshes. And in other places in the Old Testament where it clearly means the big Red Sea, they call it Yam Suf. It also, if we just believe this passage, it says there is a huge wall of water. Again, the word for wall there in in the Hebrew doesn't mean something short. It wasn't like there was a swimming pool and they turned on the filter and it just kind of created a gap in the middle. This was the Red Sea. You you should Google Earth that. You can do that right now if you want to. And I I won't judge you for being on your phone. I'll pretend you're reading the Bible. And it was so, it, it split and it was so dry that the chariots felt confident to go in after them. And what do expert charioteers know? You can't drive a chariot through mud. Not very easily. That's why the Romans built all those paved roads, those cobblestone roads that still exist today because their chariots can't work, don't work on mud or in sand. This was so dry and solid enough for chariots. So this is, there, there's every reason to believe that if God wants to divide a sea, a big sea, like the Red Sea, and make it dry and hard enough to go across. He can do that because, as we've said so many times, if we can believe the first few words of the Bible, in the beginning God, we ought to be able to believe that he can do whatever he wants with what he created. So verse 23, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire and in the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel. The Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Can you imagine what the Israelites were thinking? They're in between the Red Sea and the the greatest army in the world. And they say, what are we going to do? And God says, turn around and walk through the sea. And he splits it open. And it's not even like difficult, like walking on a sandy beach. They are able to go through on dry, solid ground. And they're walking through. Can you imagine the fear? If I'm walking through walls of water, it's not like going to Atlanta to that big aquarium there and you go through that tunnel where there's water all around you. Even when I'm there, I'm thinking, how thick is that glass? How sure are we that we're not all about to be drowned and attacked by beluga whales? I don't even think beluga whales attack people, but I didn't like it in that moment, okay? It's not like that. There are two giant walls of water on each side. That's what the Bible clearly says, and they're walking through. Then they're saying, oh, this is amazing, but I'm terrified. 
This is further evidence that this was a God thing and not just a coincidence of nature. No matter how you look at it, crossing the, the Red Sea was a miracle. There's a story, and nobody really thinks the story is true. It's just a story to illustrate that there was a, a, a liberal minister, and we don't mean politically liberal. We mean liberal as in they didn't believe the Bible, was preaching in a Bible-believing church. And at some point in the sermon, this non-Bible-believing minister referred to the crossing of the Red Sea, and somebody in this little old church shouted, praise the Lord, taking all them Israelites through the deep waters. What a mighty miracle. But the minister didn't believe in miracles, so he said it was not a miracle. It was marshland. The tide was ebbing, and the children of Israel picked their way across six inches of water. And the man said, praise the Lord, drowning all them Egyptians in six inches of water. Either way, it was a miracle, but there's no reason to believe that it was not the deep Red Sea that they crossed. If we can believe there is a God, we can easily believe that he can separate water and dry up a seabed that he created. And since he can do that, what can he do in your life? And maybe the better way to ask that question is, what do you think he can't do? If he can do this, what can he not do for you? Now, he may not do what you want him to, and he never promised to. Sometimes we try to hold God to promises that he didn't make. Just like my kids will come to me and say, hey, Dad, you said you'd take us to Disney World. Now, not specifically. They don't specifically say that, but something like that. I don't remember promising you I would take you to Disney World. Oh, you did. I don't remember that. No, you totally did. I don't remember that. Well, you should. Okay, it's kind of what we do. God, why haven't you done what I think you should do? And God says, because the long way is better for you. The long way is the better way for you right now because you're not ready for what you think you're ready for. God says, trust me because I'm good. So he may put obstacles in front of you and behind you, but we can still look to him and trust him because he's powerful and works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So verse 30, chapter 14, verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw I think I missed some verses here. Let's go back. Did we talk? Did we, did we read verse 26? Okay, let me read that. It's the word of the Lord here. Let's don't miss it. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots of the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, and not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and to their left. Now, verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So we can come away from this text, and we're not done, so don't be putting up your Bibles and stuff. We can come away from this text with the same faith and belief that Israel had if we believe that God did this and that God can still do this. If we believe the truth of his word, we can leave split log today knowing that nothing will stop God's plan. And if nothing stop God's plan, stops God's plan, we can know that God will fight for us. We can know that he will work salvation for us, and he does this for his glory and our greatest good. And then Travis referred to this earlier. After this, if you look at verse 15, and the reason that I had Austin read that earlier, I hope you paid attention, is because it is the worship, poetic retelling of what happened in chapter 14. The people worshiped. After God had delivered them, the people stopped, and not only did they worship, they sang. There have been periods in my life where the worship time, or let me say the music time, because everything we do on a Sunday morning is worship and should be worship. When we're eating breakfast together downstairs, it should be an attitude of worship. But you know, sometimes we say worship, meaning only the music. We should probably stop doing that, but it's a hard habit to break. Anyway, sometimes we look at the music as that's just what gets me awake enough to last through the first 15 minutes of the sermon. But for me, there have been periods in my life where I go, can we just get the music over with? I don't like the music. The music is the irritating part because I've seen so much fake worship that I just assume that everything that makes me feel good on the inside is fake. That's wrong. It's horrible. I'm confessing that as a sin. Do not mimic me in that. 
And so there's been times when I'm like, ah, oh, this stuff. Oh, here's all the flowery stuff. Can we just get to the Bible? Can we just get to the Bible? Both of those attitudes, the one that says, let's just skip past the singing, or the one that says, I only go for the singing. The singing is my favorite part, and then I have to last through the sermon because it would be rude to get up and walk out. Either way, we're supposed to worship God through the, the, the study of his word, but also there are 400 references to singing to God in the Bible and 50 direct commands for God's followers to sing. I don't like singing. I don't like singing Christian music most of the time. I mean, Travis made fun of me last week because the ones that I like were written by people 500 years ago, or they sound like something that was written 500 years ago. And those are the ones that I like. Friday night, they sang a song and then another one back to back. And they sang this one song. And there's no disrespect to any of our people that were leading it because they didn't write it. I assume if you did, kudos. But anyway, they didn't write it. And it was just in this kind of hip hop style that I thought, well, that is unfortunate. How am I going to worship to this style of music when I hate it so bad? And then the next one came on and it was an old hymn. And I was like, now this is what I'm talking about. Here we go. And then God kind of convicted me right at that moment. And he said, hey, Shan, again, I'm not hearing him audibly. I'm just, I'm just thinking about this. The words that were in the hip hop song, and I don't know if it's hip hop, but it was something that just greatly displeased me, okay? There was whatever it was. The words to that song were better and more biblical and more glorifying to God than the words in the old hymn that I liked. And there was nothing wrong with the old hymn that we sang, but just the lyrics in the other song were even stronger. And God said, were you not paying attention last week when Travis was talking about words? I was like, no, I was, I was afraid of children's church. That's what I was doing. Oh, there's nothing to fear. It's great stuff. You should, you should sign up for it. <laughs> Sorry, Dana. You should sign up for Children's Church. It's amazing. There's a lot of fear going in, but God can do all things and bring you through seemingly impossible situations, okay? It's the whole point of this. So there are 50 direct commands to sing. So you may be here and go, Look, I don't sing at church because I don't like the sound of my voice. And you might even think, and other people don't like the sound of my voice. And that may be true. But let me tell you somebody that loves to hear the sound of your voice worshiping. And it's God. But Shan, if I sing, I'm going to be out of tune. Nobody cares. God doesn't care. And you shouldn't care. If I sing, people are going to think that I'm a little less manly. That's the dumbest reason. That's the dumbest one. Men don't sing in public. They do when they go to Leonard Skinner concerts. So we should sing praises. And that's what they do. They just seen all this stuff. They were afraid. And then Moses writes this song and they all sing together. And then Miriam, we see, and this is all in chapter 15, 1 through 21. Miriam goes out and she gathers the ladies and she teaches them and they all play their tambourines. And if you're thinking, if you read this song and you think, that is a song that was played by tambourines. It's not exactly a jam. It is not what my, my daughter calls a bop, okay? This is not something you go, man, that makes me feel good. All right. No, it says, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. We don't come away from a passage, a song like that and go, whoo, that made me feel good today. People died. Yeah, no, I mean, we don't. But when we realize in the context that God is doing something that is fulfilling a promise, we go, I'm going to sing my heart out because God is the kind of God who brings people out of seemingly impossible situations. When they're stuck between the sea and the army, when they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, when they're stuck between somewhere that you can't imagine getting out of and another place that you can't imagine getting out of, you look to your left, you look to your right, clowns to the left, you jokers to the right, sorry, I had to get that out, I couldn't go on. But when there's stuff on this side and you say, I can't get out, I can't get out, there's nowhere to go, I can't look anywhere. But we can always look up. We can always look to God who will work for you and who will bring you salvation. And we need to remember as we are thinking about 15, and again, I want you to read chapter 15 on your own. We'll pick up in verse 22 of chapter 15 next week if the Lord allows it. We need to worship and we need to worship intentionally. And we remember the best worship songs don't make us feel good about us. It's okay to feel good about you. I listened to a song this morning. It made me feel good about me. Not a Christian song, but I was in a bad mood. So I listened to that song and it made me feel good about me. 
And then I listened to a Christian song that was better in its theology, but it made me feel good. But the best worship songs make us feel good about God. And let me, let me change that. Maybe it doesn't even make you feel good about God. It just tells the truth about God. You don't even have to feel good about it. But the truth is the truth, and it doesn't change on our ability to stomach it. The best worship songs proclaim who God is, what he has done, along with the Scripture. And believe it or not, chapter 14 and chapter 15, it's the same thing. We come away from this passage with these reminders of the greatness of God. The Israelites were like us. They were stubborn, stubborn people. But God, to these stubborn people, was great. And he showed them amazing grace. And he will be great and give you more grace if you come to him by trusting in Jesus as the substitute for our sins. Remember, he is the Passover lamb that was the final Passover lamb. And that's the reason that we don't make sacrifices anymore. And that's the reason that in, in evangelical homes, we put a cross up there and Jesus isn't on it because he's not still dying for our sins. He did that once and for all. That's why this cross is not a crucifix. It's there because Jesus has been our final substitute. He died on the cross, but then he didn't stay in the tomb. He rose from the dead so that we can believe and follow him and so that we can have trust. I'm knowing exactly what Moses said about them to them is true for us. Don't fear. Stand firm. Trust God. And you will see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you. Let's pray together. It seems like every time I get done with a sermon, God, I say that it's, it's easy to preach these things, but it's so much harder to get off the stage and live it. And it's easy to hear these things and amen these things while we're in this room, but it's harder to leave here and continue to trust that you are so good that we don't have to fear, that we can stand firm and we can believe that you will deliver us. It's difficult because sin pulls on us and it pulls us that direction and our sin is comfortable to us, but let your Holy Spirit show us the truth that sin is a lie, it is a temporary comfort and it will lead to greater pain in the future. And leave us with this great truth that you are worthy to bring us where you want us to be Sometimes that'll be through really great feeling things. Other times it will be through impossible situations, seemingly impossible situations. But we believe with all of our faith that we can muster what you told us is true. That with you, Father, nothing is impossible. So this morning we bring all of our impossibilities to you and we lay them at your feet so you will overcome like you did at the Red Sea. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and continue to worship while we sing.
been with us tonight. And remember tonight at 6 o'clock, we have our theology class. We'd love for you to come. It's going to be downstairs. And then this Wednesday, we'll be on our regular schedule. So at this time, I'll ask our deacon this week to come pray for us. All right. And if anybody needs to talk any further, there'll be people milling around outside in the foyer. If you need uh, to talk about what it means to know Christ, we'd love to talk with you about that. Father, we uh, thank you for the blessings of life, for all you do for us every day. We thank you for a church that believes in Christ, that has prayer time, reaches out to save souls, tells people the good news of Jesus. We pray that you continue to guide us as we go into our nation field in front of the church to tell others about all that God has done for us. Guide us safely, be the first to be asking in your name. Is that one? No.